Happy New Year, friends. Here we are. It is 2024, a new year, a blank page. I love the promise of a new year, don't you? It's the icing on the cake after this very festive holiday season. Uh, by the way, I hope you had an amazing holiday season with friends and family, potentially, or even on your own. But I really hope that it brought you a lot of joy and you were able to relax and recharge and rejuvenate going into this new year. I always find that new years represent limitless possibilities for the year ahead. It's a moment to reflect on the past and think ahead into our futures. My career coach asked us, my accountability group, to write a letter to our future selves at the end of 2024. What will we say to our future self uh, when we wrap up this next year? What will be, we be proud of? What, will, what do we want to accomplish? But more importantly, who do we want to become this year? So those are some of the things I will be thinking about and writing a letter to myself probably tomorrow. Um, and then I'll be sealing that letter and opening it sometime in the holiday season of 2024 and see if what I said came true. If what, if the goals that I put out for myself happened, if I became an even better version of myself I'm really excited about the opportunity to do this for the very first time. Maybe you'll want to try it. If you're anything like me, you're ready to commit even stronger to your bold moves this year to continue fulfilling your highest potential. And of course, that's what we're doing here on the podcast when I'm bringing on all of these extraordinary guests to share their bold move stories. And I have also introduced the Bold Moves Recipe, which is a framework to unlock how to make bold moves. I hope you got a chance to listen to that. And if you haven't, definitely go back. It's that last episode in the queue and give it a listen. Because today's episode is with a very special guest. Uh, her name is Michelle Morgan. And this episode is a masterclass for the Bold Moves recipe I taught in episode 20. So like I said, if you haven't listened yet, please do go listen to that episode first. I think you'll get a lot more out of this episode if you listen to that one first. And the, the final thing I want to say before we get started in this episode, and so now if you go and sign up for the Bold Moves podcast club on my website, you are going to get emails that are going to walk you through step-by-step step the Bold Moves recipe so that you can start thinking about your bold moves and how to accomplish those bold moves more effectively using this recipe. Uh, as a reminder, it's your desire plus who plus action equals how to make a bold move and in that email series, I break down exactly each part of this recipe, give you prompts to think about it for yourself, and share some stories about how other people have used this recipe to make their bold moves. So I think it's super empowering to get this recipe, start working through it, and I think that it's going to help you unlock some of those key components to making your own bold moves by leveraging a framework that so many people have used to get to where they want to go, and importantly, to make some headway in who they want to become. Push pause real quick, open up the show notes for this episode, look down the page and find the Bold Moves Podcast Club in the show notes. There will be a link right there. Click that link, it'll take you to my website, where you can quickly sign up for the Bold Moves Podcast Club. Then come back here and push play. And we are going to get into today's episode right now. One, two, three, four. Welcome. 
Welcome to the Bold Moves How Did You Know podcast, a podcast for the naturally curious who want to define their own path. Here, I'm sharing bold move stories that propelled my guests from curiosity to action. And in doing so, they've defined a path that is purposeful to them. Through these stories, I hope you'll be inspired to pursue your boldest dreams. Today, I can't wait to introduce you to my friend, Michelle Morgan. (laughs) Michelle is an experienced designer with a specialty in spatial morphology. She has experience in architecture, co-working, and seed stage startups. As an architect, her work includes planning for the 2012 Olympics and writing the plan for the development of Pont City Market as an innovation center. If you are in Atlanta, you definitely know Pont City Market. <laughs> and she is the founder of Hub Next Atlanta, a co-working space. As an experienced designer, she has worked on projects for AT&T, Cracker Barrel, and Georgia Power, with a focus on integrating multiple projects through a customer journey lens. Currently, Michelle is the co-founder of an experienced design consultancy, Sharpen Partners. Michelle, hello. Thank you so much for coming onto my podcast. How are you today? Hey, Kristen, I am so excited to be here. Um, This is like an extension. We have lunch on like, what is it? Every other Friday, we get together with our friend Eileen. So this is like getting to get like extra Kristen in my week. Oh, so yeah. Well, I hope that's a good thing, but I so enjoy our lunches. I was just going to say that like these lunches to me have meant everything in my transition period from corporate world into entrepreneurship. And so Before we start, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being such a resource to me. And I don't know, I mean, there's so many people who support and encourage me, but just to have you there with me on a biweekly basis and like checking in, like, how are you doing? How's your journey going? What can I help you with? Has been, has meant everything to me, Michelle. Uh, So thank you so much for that. And we're going to talk all about business yeah. and some of the insights that you share with me during our lunches with now many people. So thank you for being here. Yes. Yes. I think it is so important when you are working on your own or trying to build a business or anything like that. It is so important to remember that sometimes what you need is to just say it out loud to somebody else for them to validate, like, you do need to think about this, but you don't need to overthink it. And mm-hmm. it is important, but there's like, there's a hundred ways to do it right. It's, and maybe one like really wrong way. So like avoid that, but like the other ways are fine and just pick one and do it. And, and so like having people to bounce things out of, off of like that at our lunches, um, it's, and we all met at, what was it? The Wonder Woman dinner, yeah. which happens kind of nationally, but we met at the one in Atlanta. And that to me is the same kind of thing. It's like having people to just say it out loud in front of. Yeah, (laughs) I know. I know. I, it would, you know, what you just said was so freeing. Like it really opened up my, like I had an epiphany in what you just said, which was there are a hundred ways to do it right. And only, you know, maybe a few things to not do, but there are a hundred ways to do it right. That is so freeing and empowering actually, because some people are stuck on the idea Mm -hmm. that there's only one way, but that's not true at all. So, okay. All right. So we're going to get into all of this. You have a variety of experiences. You have done so many incredible things and I can't wait to talk to you about it all, but let's hear about your journey, your life journey, your career journey, whatever journey you want to share. Let's just give people a little bit of background on who is Michelle Morgan. Yeah. So, um, I am a native, native Atlantan. Um, to a degree. I'm waving goodbye to my husband in the background. Um, But uh, there's like, you know, 400 of us who were born here and still live here. And then there's like 6 million people that have gathered around us and made the place really, really interesting. (laughs) Um, So I'm from here, but I've lived in a couple of other places. I grew up outside the city in a really small town. And I mentioned that because I think that is part of what drives sort of different parts of my personality. I went to Auburn to architecture school. Um, I did that to get out of going to a women's college um, because I had applied to and been accepted to lots of like really, really awesome women's colleges. And then I was like, uh, no, this is not the right environment for me. 
not because they're not great schools, but because they're cloistered environments. And I had grown up in this really small town and I was like, I don't, I need a different environment. Um, well, and, and maybe be overwhelmed, maybe be in a place where everybody doesn't know you and doesn't give you leeway to just like, when you grew up in a small town, everybody knew you before you knew anybody. Right. And they are like, oh, that's Michelle. And her parents are like this and her older brother's like this. And, and so you get a lot of passes for maybe not understanding what's going on or not doing things the way other people do. And, um, you know, people think of small towns as like a place to conform. That was not my experience. Um, and so I think I had a lot to learn going out into the world, especially a place like Auburn, that's like giant. Um, and there are all kinds of people doing all kinds of things from all kinds of places. And like, I suddenly became nobody special. And I think that was awesome. Um, I got a degree in architecture. I loved it. It's a great program. Anybody that has an opportunity to do an architecture degree or a design degree, it's fantastic. It will future proof you like nothing you've ever seen um, because it's project based and you have to actually produce work. And so you have to think and do, which is really important. Um, and then after that, I went to Birmingham. I worked at the most amazing firm, um, Jatina Fisher Acock. Just if anybody knows them, they're now called, now called GA Studio, and they're in this architectural manufacturing thing called Blocks. It's incredible, all things to look up. I lived in New York for a little while, and then I came home and um, I worked as an architect for a little while. I did some residential design that I'd never done before, vacation houses, stuff like that. It was super fun. And then I woke up one day and I was designing a house for a hip hop guy who was um, different, quirky, eccentric. Um, <laughs> and I was like, this is making me crazy. And the market collapsed. And I was like, I got to go find something else to do. That's how I wound up doing the Pond City Market thing, because I met a real estate developer that was leading that project. And he was like, you seem smart and different. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I keep thinking that. <laughs> like, let me do something weird. Um, so I did. And then from there, I ended up opening the co working space, which really was life changing for me. Um, owning a business and helping startups and like my design career, where as the architect, you know, like I have to get these two things to fit together and they don't really fit together. And it's like my job is to figure out what happens in between. And that means I have to ask a lot of people who have a lot of information that's very technical and I have to figure out how to put it together in a way that's artistic and beautiful. Um, and I took that approach and applied it to understanding what it is that startup entrepreneurs are doing. So I taught myself how to build a financial model. I taught myself about go to market strategies and I did it by asking a lot of questions. Um, the business failed <laughs> and for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is that WeWork came into the market and had unlimited amounts of money. And that's a whole other topic for a whole other podcast <laughs> about failure. Um, but I, And I can talk about that all day and about what it does to you and what it can do for you. And <laughs> But, um, and I was like depressed and sad and, you know, like my ego was all wrapped up in this identity of being a business owner and being in the startup space. And, and I was like, what am I going to do? And my dear sweet husband who is the nicest person in the world was like hey why don't you take a class because you love learning things and that will kind of boost you and like bring you back to who you are and then from there from a good positive place you can make a decision about what you want to do next um and I went to general assembly I went saying hey I want to take the data science class um, and kudos to the girl who interviewed me. Her name is Zoe Jordan. Um, and she was like, okay, I think you could totally do this data science class. That's great. But like, you're a very experienced designer. Why are you not in the design class to like learn how to design digital products? And I was like, I don't know. I just, I'm not interested. And she's like, well, why don't you do this design challenge and just like take it and send it back to me and, and let's just see, like, let's, and she was dead on. I sent it back and she showed it to the guy who taught the class and he was like, get her in this class. <laughs> and so now <laughs> um, that's a guy named John Kay. I love, I love calling out people who like helped me along the way. Um, 
And John Kay was like so encouraging. And he's like, Michelle, you got this. Like, and I had been a designer at that point. I'm old, right? So that was six years ago and I'm 53. <laughs> and I had been a designer since I was like 22. <laughs> and so it was like, oh, oh, I do have a lot of experience and I do really love this. And I, and so I got back into it. I worked at one agency and then another. And then this February, uh, 2023, um, my lovely creative director from my second agency, uh, a guy named JD Jordan, he and I have gone out on our own and created an experience design consultancy. Um, yeah, so that's like the, the chronological story, but I think it helps people understand, like, I'm not afraid to change. <laughs> I'm not afraid to try something I haven't done before. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I love mm -hmm. that because I, I put, I, I can just all, you know, I just always try to relate from my own experience and I put myself in, in my shoes, you know, where I was not even just early in my career, middle of my career. And I didn't see options sometimes, Michelle. And, you know, it does help to have conversations with people and, and look back at their stories to see, oh, there are options along the path. And what I really felt when you were recounting your story was that people would come into your story and introduce new thoughts and ideas and curiosities for you to consider. And then those that eventually led to the next opportunity. So I wanted to connect this um, to my Bold Moves recipe, which I just introduced on my last podcast. Um, you know, I had been talking to 18 guests um, over the first year of my podcast, and this is going this is going to air in 2024, but we're talking in 2023. But you know, so over the year, I have um, talked, spoken with about 18 different people, and I started to kind of analyze the different patterns and commonalities within these stories about how they come to make bold moves, and it's three parts: your desire who plus sorry your desire plus who plus action equals your next bold move right and you were the first person michelle that i spoke to about my bold moves recipe before i aired that episode i was like okay i think i'm on to something here i'm going to share it with michelle and eileen who is the other amazing woman who is in our bi-weekly lunches she also was interviewed on this podcast a couple podcasts ago so go back and listen to that one if you haven't already you all were the first to hear my bold moves recipe and i love see this is why you're so great at what you do because you distilled it down into the you plus the who plus the do so i had your desire plus who plus action and you so quickly organized it from your desire equals you plus who plus action equals do you who do and i love yes <laughs> thank you um, i love that you i love that you love it it's like so for me it's always about what is the thing that is going to point directly at where you want people to get to and how do you make it like super super simple it doesn't have to be amazing it has to be memorable i think this is something that's really really important especially for women so we we kind of sit on this very thin tightrope of balancing what people kind of refer to. I'm going to use some kind of retro terms real quick. I don't necessarily think about it this way, but I think it helps people understand what, you know, like I grew up in the seventies, right? Um, so like this women's intuition, right? Women have a gut instinct about what they should and shouldn't do. They just know things, right? And a lot of times people talk about maternal instinct and, and things like that. I think it's true and it's real. I also think it's very tricky because society and culture spends a lot of time telling women that they're not the decision maker, that they don't know what to do, that the best use of their life is to be supportive of everyone else. And so we get into this situation where we're coached into an in instinctual response to play the second fiddle or be the second banana, right? 
And that means our gut instinct is conditioned into, well, what's good for everybody else? What's good for everybody else? I myself struggled with this a lot in my 20s and 30s. Um, And I think I always knew that it didn't feel great, but I didn't understand. And I didn't necessarily have a great set of examples like people do today of what an alternative looked like. And oftentimes, especially I think in more conservative environments and more male dominated environments and things like that, when you start to approach it from the from the position of i need to think about my own desire i need to think about my own ambition right that can be a very dirty word when (laughs) women take it as their own um you will get a lot of pushback and a lot of blowback i guess is really the word of you know don't be selfish don't be you know you have to be a team player there's a lot of stuff that comes at you and so i think women taking their time to really get, I mean, I I was in my late thirties, early forties, when I feel like I really got in touch with, oh, I, (laughs) I want to do this because I want to do it. And I'm so tired of other people telling, and I made a lot of mistakes being too committed to something, um, either because it had been something I really wanted to do and it wasn't working for me, but I was completely unwilling to back up on it. Right. Because I was so new at, you know, it's like being a toddler. You're like, absolutely not. I'm not going <laughs> to, I demanded this and now it's mine and I will keep doing it. I will die on this hill every day. Right. But I had to give myself some room to say like, okay, so you, this is a new skill. You are, this part of you is young and undeveloped and you need to give yourself some room to make some mistakes and to quietly in a conversation with yourself, decide how you feel about those mistakes. Not, yes, you're going to make them in public and yes, you need to own them in public and you need to get to a place where you can be like, everybody makes mistakes, whatever. But to get to that place you and you have to get together. I know that you're another person who is um, a a fan of or a follower of these concepts around the law of attraction. And there's sort of like you as the person, right? The physical person walking around. And then there's like your inner being, I guess, is what um, the person I listen to talks about. And I think about those two people getting together and having a conversation. And talking about like the inner being knew when you took that on, knew that you wanted it, knew that you desired it, and probably knew that it wasn't going to work out. And that inner being has to coach this person (laughs) who's experiencing this life today. I don't mean to get too woo-woo for everybody here, but like those two people have to get together and have a conversation and agree at the end of the day about the purpose of that experience and the purpose of not getting it right or getting it too right and getting overwhelmed. You know, there's a lot of things that can kind of go sideways when you're trying to do stuff like that. And I think a lot of the things that where we feel sort of jostled around by other people's ideas, it's because we didn't take the time to sit down and get in agreement and then align with with ourselves. And we're not being nice to ourselves about the chances that we took. And I mean, you're talking about the, the you piece of the recipe which is getting really clear on who you are authentically. What are your, what are your motivations? What are your um, purposes? Where, what are your values? You know, um, and how, and once you identify those and you name them, there's so much to naming these things and not just letting them float out in like a being like, oh, I just feel this way, but like actually put a label and a name to it. Like one of my um, values is fun or variety right and then when i named it and i was like oh i love a variety of experiences then you can like analyze your life and being like how much variety is in my life oh well maybe because there's not a lot of variety in my life i'm actually feeling that in my body that like things don't feel great like maybe i feel a little stuck demoralized um just down, you know, like, like lethargic, you know? 
And I, I think the more you start to ask yourself these questions, the more in tune you're, you're going to get with who you are authentically. And once you have an understanding about that, you bring a new lens into your decision making. Um, and I think, you know, that's what you were saying here, right? Um, so I think that's, that's why that desire piece is, is really important. And, you know, I do hear you when you say that it was, it can be challenging being a woman and trying to pay attention to this and the dichotomy of that narrative. On one token, people are saying, you have women, woman's intuition. On the other hand, they're saying, don't put yourself first, put everyone else first. <laughs> So if you are like, what is your intuition saying? Um, and you're like, oh, okay, it's clearly X, but everyone else is saying Y, and I'm trained to listen to everyone else because I need to put their needs first, then we have another reason for that separation. And so I thought that was a really important point you made there. I think also, so I am not a parent, but when I listen to my uh, and this happens with men and women, right? Because men's roles in the parental re relationship have changed dramatically in the last 20 years. But when I listen to my friends who are parents, especially if they're really engaged um, and they're balancing career and parenting and all of that, I think all of those things that I'm experiencing with that dissonance and conflict, I think they get doubled or tripled because- right now you're trying to juggle these different roles that are seen as um, support roles, right? Being a parent is very much about physically supporting the growth and evolution of another person, sometimes several other people, right? Um, and I think that can be really, really challenging when you bring in all of these stereotypical traditional messages about how it should be done and how it should shouldn't be done and you know like if we could outlaw people telling <laughs> telling women in the workplace like especially mothers in the workplace like you should do this like just just please stop just like could you give that woman a menu that says here are exactly. a thousand things you could do what looks good to you <laughs> exactly yeah that's that's such a good point you know I think the other thing I would say there is because this happened to me and it was a real awakening. Once I started living more in my desires, my whole being got lifted. I'm like, I'm using body language here, which I know listeners can't see, but my whole body, my whole being lifted, elevated to another level energetically. And when you are in that place, yeah. Um, you are living that every day it is now going out into the world onto your family it is making you more happy it is making everybody else more happy so truly you know when they say it's not selfish to put your needs ahead of others this is what they mean yes. which i didn't know yes. i didn't yes. know until i did all of this discovery around this recipe but it is like once you put yourself first and you understand who you are at your core authentically, mm -hmm. you raise to a higher elevation, you have a higher energy, you feel way more in alignment because you are actively doing things in your life that make you feel like who you are and that spreads to everybody else. Well, and I think the other thing that happens is, you know, the second part of the recipe is the who, right? And so it's like, I've discovered my authentic self and now that's what I'm using to connect with other people. Yes. And so I end up, I, it's not like you magically don't have any conversations with people that could be distractions or take you off your course or, um, you know, people will offer you all kinds of opportunities and you have to decide if they're the right fit for you or not. But what's, what happened to me when I connected more with my core purpose and my core kind of way of being was that when I came across somebody that had what seemed like a great opportunity, but the caveat was that I needed to be slightly different than who I am. Um, and so this shows up in a lot of different ways, right? Like, hey, Michelle, I really want you to take this job, but this person that you're going to work with doesn't like working with women. You know, and nobody ever says it that clearly, but like, that's one of the things that happens in the world. Or they might say like, 
I love how you do this, but maybe if you could just like not intimidate other people so much, or I love how you do this, but like, if you could maybe just not say so many things or <laughs> like I get dinged for all kinds of stuff, like <laughs> crazy stuff at work. But, um, and so I think like, that's one of those places where I think this thing that we're talking about, your authentic self and attracting opportunities with your authentic self, you have to give yourself credit for, look at this amazing opportunity that I attracted. You then have to say to yourself, and you know what? <laughs> this is not the right one. Because if it was, it wouldn't come with this caveat that asks me to be less than who I am. Now, I'm not talking about people who are like obnoxious and abrasive and things like that. I'm just talking about like, people won't say, I need you to show up in a particular way. They'll say, I want you to show up as you. I want you, I want to support the growth of you in the way that you are, right? And then I think beyond that, it it starts to help you when you get in touch with this authentic self, you do, I got a lot of opportunities to do a lot of fascinating things. And it was like, how do I choose? And you're like, well, you choose by, it's like trying on pants, right? And like you choose by trying them on and you're like, these don't fit. And that, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. It means these pants don't fit and I need to put them back and get another pair. And you just keep trying yes. them on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And oh my gosh, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because it just pulled forward the recipe in such a clear, you know, I don't know, just articulating it with somebody else I think is really helpful. But I was going to say you are going to maybe get some opportunities that might not be the right fit, but rather than being frustrated about it, now you're empowered yeah. by it. You're like, oh my gosh, I can actually say no because that isn't right for me. I'm a hundred percent clear about it. And now I'm not debating the decision-making. I just know this isn't the right fit. And now I feel way more empowered and I don't have a, um, a mindset of losing an opportunity. I have a mindset of finding the right opportunity. It changes the whole game. It, it does. And it, I, I'm going to talk about one more thing that I think happens to women in this situation. Like for me, it opened the door to say, you know, so everybody says no is a complete sentence, but I grew up in the deep South and I can't get on board with that. Right. It just, it doesn't feel right to me. So I do feel a lot of times, like I want to explain to somebody like, Hey, that's not the right thing for me. And here's why. Right. Um, so when I would do it that way, people would say, oh, no, no, you're wrong. This, this is perfect for you. This is why, right? And they're trying to persuade me. What I have learned to do, and this is so powerful, is to think to myself, okay, what's wrong with that? And what do I want instead? And so I will say back to the person like, that sounds like a great opportunity. And if you can make this happen, I would love to do it. And their response to me negotiating tells me everything I need. Some people will be like, the audacity you have to ask me to, and you're like, woohoo, I can check out of this conversation super easy. Um, and then some people will really surprise you. You know, they'll, they might say like, yeah, I think that would make this really great, but I don't have the capacity to do that. Um, and so I understand why you would turn it down, right? And then some people will come back to you and say, yes, I can get that for you. Is there anything else that you want? And at that point, you're just like, oh my God, I'm off to the races. Like now I'm in touch with who I am. I'm in touch with what I need. I have, I'm thinking about my own like forward growth through these activities. I have all kinds of ideas about things that I need and I'm not afraid to ask for them anymore because what I'm saying is I would love to be in a relationship with you. I would love to be in a project with you, but it needs to work for both of us. Amazing. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, you know, I think what you're raising for me too, as we're kind of continuing to talk through some of this, there is great area in each of these areas, right? Like the, the desire piece, the who piece, the action piece, there's always going to be a gray area. You know, it's not it's not like, okay, I've figured out my desire and now I'm connecting with people to, you know, see about these new opportunities and maybe it's directional shifts, maybe it's just 
taking on a new opportunity at work, you know, whatever, a move, maybe even like, you know, I don't know, sometimes you could be living in, in, in completely the wrong place. And you're like, wait a minute, like where I am doesn't make sense for who I want to be. Right. Yeah. And like, that's a whole move now. It's like, I need to move somewhere. There's always going to be a gray area, you know, it's, it's never going to just be like, you know, one, you know, one puzzle piece next, 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 right. The puzzle pieces will eventually all come together, but sometimes you're going to have to try different pieces for it to all, you know, work out. And as you said, Michelle, um, in some of your experiences, you know, there's been failure, there's been failure in mine and the more experience you get either in life or acting in new ways, you're going to know how to respond to these moments. Right. Yeah. And, uh, all of it is good information for the next time you go at bat to give it a try. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And I think sometimes, so, um, I think it was 2009, 2010, I started the first co-working space. And then along the way, we started a couple of different initiatives um, that in and of themselves probably could have been their own business, right? Um, And then, so 2023, I started this business. So we're talking about like a 13 year gap, a lot of different things, a lot of different people, um, you know, and and a lot of kind of identity issues and like uh, just a lot of stuff, right? There are things that I did in both situations that I saw them completely different or opposite, right? There are some things that I saw as a failure in the first business that I realized through the process of learning lots of things that like, it wasn't a failure. It was a contextual issue, right? What you did was the right thing. It resonated with you. It felt authentic to you. Um, It helped a lot of people. It had a lot of positive results, but contextually it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right place. You didn't have the right people around you. You know, it could be all kinds of different things. And so I might do that exact same thing again I might change it up a little bit, but I've learned so much more that it does not, even if it sort of nets the same result, it doesn't feel the same, right? And what's that saying about, I think it's a Native American saying about the same man never stands in the same river twice because the river is different and the man is different. Um, I, I think that is so incredibly true and probably one of the most important things about your career that you can't, you can't, you cannot predict when the thing that you learned before is going to come in handy. And you can't ever say, I'll never do that again, or I'll always do it this way. Or because so much about business and so much about the economic environment and how people relate to each other. And it's changing so rapidly and significantly right now. I think you you have to be very agile in your way of thinking about it. You, out of maybe anybody I know, get me to think critically about things that maybe I haven't thought about um, in, in that way before. So that's a real cool thing that you bring into my life. One of the things that you said, um, let me back up here. Okay, you said, I want to support people who make brave choices. And man, this really made me stop in my tracks when you said this, because I'm think I'm connecting it to bold moves. You have to be brave to make a bold move, right? And, you know, we were talking about another situation and you said, I want to support people who make brave choices. So what represents a brave choice? First off, what does that mean to you? And then I want to ask some other further questions. It can, it can look a lot of different ways. I think for me, more often than not, and this is coming from my own experience, so it's going to look different for a lot of different people, but if I see somebody operating against sort of stereotypical expectations, and I mostly mean that in a way that like those expectations keep you from growing or keep you from, right? So like anybody who... 
one of the things that comes up a lot in creative offices is people can be very conflict avoidant. Um, one of the bravest things I've ever seen anybody do in that situation is read a whole bunch of books about conflict, right? Like, it sounds like a really small thing, right? Um, you're at home at night, you're not even at the office and you're you're reading books about conflict. That is really brave, like in a conflict avoidant environment where that is a tribal norm. And you're like, look, I don't want to bulldoze over people, but like, we got to talk about some stuff here. And so like, you just decide, like, I'm not waiting for somebody to tell me how to do this. I'm not waiting for somebody to give me permission. I'm going to go home and build a skill. And then I'm going to look carefully, maybe not carefully. I'm going to be, I'm going to be on the lookout for an opportunity to try these things out. Right. I also think there's a degree of bravery in being willing to test your own limits. Um, so this, this might not play, I'm a Gen Xer, right? And Gen Xers are classic overworkers, um, classic workaholics, like whatever you want to call us. So this might not play super well with like a, an elder Z or a younger millennial, but, um, Sometimes I think it's really wise to say, I don't have a limit. My goal is to see how good a job I can do. How much can I learn? How, how fast can I do something? How, you know, how systematic can I be? How thorough can I be? How, these are all really great skills and you don't learn them Nece you don't necessarily get an opportunity for somebody to compensate you for doing that job. But if you learn how to do it that way, you certainly get an opportunity for being compensated for being that person. And so I think taking the risk of investing in yourself and being able to divorce your... There have been times when I had to say... I really don't think my boss understands what I do and I'm okay with that. Um, and I'm not going to spend my time trying to get validated by that person. I'll go get validated somewhere else. I'll learn to validate myself. That's a really brave thing to do to take responsibility for your mindset and your own assessment of the situation and validation of your work. Um, and it can be as simple as like every day at the end of the day in my work journal, I write down like, this is what I learned today. This is what I um, did well. Here's a place where I met a challenge. Um, and a lot of times it's, these are a lot of different examples, but um, I think the other type of bravery I see most often in the office is a person who has credibility or institutional power or influence and they use it on behalf of someone else. So if you already have institutional power and you use it on your own behalf, sometimes that requires a degree of bravery, right? Because you might be asking for something that's outside the norm of your environment. But like, let's say you and I are working together and let's say you're, you're brand new. You're my, you're not a junior <laughs> content strategist, but like, let's just say that you are, right? And you're new, you're unproven, but you and I have had a lunch together. Maybe we had a couple chats, like having coffee. And I'm like, this girl is really smart. And I think, um, I think she deserves to be heard. Right. And so we go into a meeting together. I'm a strategist. And so somebody asks the content question of me. I could answer it. I could take something you said to me yesterday and use that as the answer, <laughs> I could do a lot of things. But what I should do, and the brave thing to do, and it would require some bravery on your part too, right, is to say, you know, I am most interested in how Kristen wants to approach this. And so, Kristen, would you answer the question? I'm going to repeat it, right? <laughs> I'm going to repeat it because I want everybody to hear me with my institutional influence asking you what you think. 
And I think making way for people to contribute to the project, um, you know, a lot of times, and this happens all the time, right? You don't necessarily want to open the floor for a junior person because they haven't spoken up in a meeting before and you don't know how it's going to go. Okay, fine. So I've had enough experience in meetings that if you're struggling with answering, I can prompt you, I can help you, I can support you, I can do all of those things. And that is actually my job. So I think there are a lot of places like that where people, they want to take the easy way, which is, well, I can control my own answer. I can, we cannot get off on a tangent. We cannot introduce ideas that I don't want the client to hear you know, things like that. Sure. But the brave thing is to say, let's open it up. Let's hear somebody else's thing. And I have to be confident enough in myself to say, those are really good points. Let's take this conversation. If it's, if it's more or different or something than I, for me to say, let's take this and Kristen and I'll come back to all of you in the next meeting. And Kristen will talk to you about where we want to go with this strategy. Right. But I don't need to, I see people all the time undermining people on the team in order to maintain control. And I think what I'm talking about is the exact opposite of that, which is like believing in yourself enough to know, like, I can manage the situation. It's not a problem. What were one or two examples of bravery in your life specifically? What brave choices have you made? When I was, okay, I told you about, I was working for the hip hop guy and he was a little bit crazy and the market collapsed. Um, I went to a networking event with a really good friend of mine. Um, and she said, you said you don't want to be an architect anymore. So when somebody asks you tonight, what you do, what are you going to tell them? And I was like, well, I'm an architect. And she's like, you're not like, you need a new title. And I was like, okay. So we're joking around about it in the car on the way over. And I thought about this guy that I worked with in my first job. And he, so he was the CFO for the office, but he was the son of the senior partner and it was complicated. And, you know, he was young and had this like big job and everything. So people would ask him at parties what he did. And he would tell them he was a sock model. <laughs> and then he would like raise up his pant leg and let them look at his calf and stuff. And I was thinking about him and thinking like, oh my God, this guy's hilarious. Um, <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, what, like, what do, wh what do I want people's what do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And if I just tell people I am that. Um, and so this, this guy walks up to me and is talking to me and he says, uh, what do you do? And I said, I'm a design strategist. And he was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and I was like, well, I am an expert in design and understanding how design can operate in the service of your business to create a return on investment. He offered me a job that night and I took it. <laughs> Michelle, that is, um, that is the bold moves recipe. You knew yeah. who you want. You're like, I'm not this anymore. I'm that. You met somebody. I'm this. Yeah. You said your desire, it created a new opportunity for you. And the whole thing was, I had thought enough about the fact that I did not want to inherit bad decisions. As an architect, you inherit a lot of decisions from the developer and the property owner and the person who put together the proposal and the money guy and the, you know, this, that, and the other. And they make all these decisions that are they have nothing to do with the design, right? And they sometimes have nothing to do with the physics of getting a building out of ground. Um, and they, you know, they set a budget that has nothing to do with anything, in, but you inherit all these decisions and now you're in this box. And I thought, what gets me up the food chain? Like what gets me to the plate? I think I can make a better decision than that guy, but I don't have an MBA. I don't, I'm not the one who has the money. I'm not the accountant. I'm not. And I was like, who in there, who can tell that person what to do? <laughs> and that's where I came up with the strategy part of it. 
And then I thought, and how do you convince that guy? How do you convince all those quant people that the creative should be telling them what to do? And I was like, oh, you start talking about what they care about, which is return on investment. Right. So like a lot of this is about, and these are core, core principles in my life that I think as the designer, (laughs) it's my job to speak other people's language. Like I get that they don't understand what I do. I read a lot about what they do and about what their goals are. I ask a lot of questions about that. I learned to speak their language. So we've never spoken about bravery on this podcast, which to me is a critical component, uh, you know, trait and characteristic of somebody who makes bold moves consistently, because it is uncomfortable putting yourself in a situation that is contrast to how other people operate or what's expected of you potentially. And so um, I love that we're able to have this conversation from that standpoint of bravery, right? Um, and, And encourage people to be like, You know, even if you're getting messages of conformity, there are people out there, and that's also the intent of having these conversations on the podcast with other people who aren't doing everything that everyone else says they should do. And I think with each little breadcrumb, it starts to create a confidence and a courage in other people to be like, okay, let me just take a baby step out of my comfort zone. Let me try this out. Let me see what happens when I do that. Um, so, so it's a cool part of, of what, you know, the, the brave conversation is just like, you know, I didn't, I didn't have really two feet to stand on and I did it. And, and that's what your situation just, you know, says, like, you didn't know your ne- what your next job was. You, you didn't really know who you were going to be, but you just made a guess and that, that actually attracted an opportunity. And I think it says a lot too, like courage there this is a whole podcast episode in itself and i i'm certainly not an expert on bravery or courage but there is a component to self-worth that you were just talking about too you believed in yourself to make this claim that i could deliver results right and so there's so many different characteristics and traits baked into what it means to be bold and i just hope you know little by little introducing some of these concepts and ways that people can think about being bold in their lives, which can really have a pretty substantial and significant impact on how they you know, feel about their life. I don't know if it's feel or just that way of living their life just changes so dramatically. I think it's one of those things where um, it's it's got two sides to the same coin. It's like, I... I was talking about like working hard enough to kind of test your limits, right? So like, that's the side of you that says, I'm going to say this thing and then I'm going to do what I have to do to deliver, right? And I've tested myself previously. So I I know that I can work and work and work at it until I figure it out. I also know I have a lot of people around me I can ask. And then the other side of it is I have enough faith in myself that if I fail, I know I have enough integrity to own it. And I know I will recover because I've gone out and tried other things, either in my social life or, um, I mean, I did all kinds of things as a young person, like helio skiing on the backside of the mountain and like all kinds of like nutty things that you're like, I failed in a lot of ways that are socially acceptable in order to build up a tolerance for taking a chance. Yeah. I do ask everybody though, one question, which is, What do you know about being bold today you wish you knew earlier on? Oh, okay. This can take a smidge of bravery on my part because I want to give you some like really quotable answer, but um, I'm going to tell you something very spicy. (laughs) I love spice. Bring it on. Okay. (laughs) Um, Being bold, whether you do it quietly or loudly, whether you do it um, as a perfectionist, whether you do it as a fly by the seat of your pants person, I don't care how you do it, but turning up the volume on who you are as a person, making yourself a person of substance and being assured of who you are 
which I think is, you know, to me, that's the core of being bold. Mm -hmm. Um, it is going to piss people off and that is not your problem. It is, it is not your job. It is no person's job to walk around making sure that they don't make anybody else mad by being themselves. Love it. All right, let's stop there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing this time with me. Thank you. Amazing. Mm -hmm. We didn't mention the name of your company at the top, Sharpen Partners. If you want to get in touch with Michelle Morgan, who is the founder of Sharpen Partners, um, where can they go, Michelle? How can they learn more about you and your business? They can always go to our website at sharpen.partners to see a little bit about what we do. Um, there's some there's some things there, but we don't like to overwhelm people. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. If you type in Michelle Morgan Sharpen, I'll pop right up. Um, maybe type in Atlanta if you're in like some far afield place just to just to, like give it another bet. Um, you can email me at michelle at sharpen.partners. Um, and I'll tell everybody, I think my phone number is on my LinkedIn and you can text me. <laughs> Amazing. You can get in touch with Michelle all the ways, y'all. I hope you love all the ways. <laughs> I hope you love this episode. If you did, please make sure to hit subscribe, follow, um, subscribe or follow. I think they call it follow now um, to this podcast. I really don't want you to miss an episode. You're building up your bold move muscle. And all of these conversations are going to help get you going on your way. So definitely make sure to subscribe and follow this podcast. Um, we will see you in the next one. And thank you again, Michelle, for being here today. This was so fun.